Now, that said, I want to return to a structure that got sort of neglected in that discussion, and that is the anterior cingulate. We've split your brain in half here. This is the brain that we've now cut right down the middle, and we're looking deep into the frontal lobe, and we see a structure there. It's right in here, and that's the anterior cingulate. Why would I want to draw attention to this? For a couple of reasons. First of all, I want to tell you that there are two parts to this structure that have only recently been discovered in the past decade. George Bush has reviewed all of this literature. By the way, it is not that George Bush. He's a neuroimager at Mass General Hospital. And he has shown that the anterior cingulate is not one, but two separate functional zones. The upper one in red, which I think should have been in blue, as you'll see in a moment, if color is to mean anything. But this upper zone is involved in helping you make decisions in social conflicts where there are social consequences now and later for what you're about to do. Whenever you face decisions in which there, are, there is a competition, a conflict, between the events of the now and what's going to happen later if you act this way, the anterior cingulate helps to negotiate that conflict. It buys you time to think about it and then allows you to execute behavior that is in your long-term welfare, not just your short-term welfare. But the blue structure has now been identified as playing a role whenever there is emotional conflict. Whenever there is an emotion elicited by the moment, but the long-term implications of showing that emotion are detrimental to your well-being, this part of the anterior cingulate lights up. Because this is where the frontal lobe is going to suppress the emotional system. And it's going to do it through that zone. We can see that here. This is the opposite hemisphere. So we're looking at the frontal lobe here. We're looking at the anterior cingulate here. We're looking at the very rostral front part of that anterior cingulate here. And we know that this region of the brain projects back into a very old primitive system known as the amygdala and the limbic system at large. The limbic system is the emotional brain. Most species with a brain and spinal cord have this system because this is where emotion comes from, and especially aggression. That is largely an amygdala activity, though it does other things besides that. So what does all of this mean? Well, let us back up. Excuse me. We know that this part of the brain is smaller in people with ADHD. And as you will see on the following diagram, that midline structure does not activate in adults with ADHD, as it does in normal adults who face social or emotional conflicts. The anterior cingulate appears to do nothing. What is that going to do? It is going to leave you prone to not regulating your limbic system. You are going to be very emotionally impulsive. You will be characterized as having low frustration tolerance, impatience, quickness to anger, unable to tolerate waiting, showing your emotions more easily than others, and more raw, unmoderated emotion, hence the term impulsive emotion, and more generally, more easily excitable. Now, if all of that sounds like a mood disorder, it isn't. Mood disorders are where the limbic system is overexpressing abnormal levels of emotion, and individuals have trouble regulating it. That would be bipolar disorder, for instance, which is largely a limbic system disorder. In contrast, ADHD is not a mood disorder. It's a failure to regulate mood disorder. It's a self-regulation of emotion disorder. The emotions the individual is having are quite normal, but most people would have suppressed them, would have inhibited, moderated, self-calmed, self-soothed, and then brought those emotions in line with their longer-term welfare in that situation. That is what the person with ADHD cannot do as well. Inhibit, self-calm, 
self-soothe, contemplate, and moderate that emotion. So if you're an adult with ADHD, you may find yourself sitting in a business meeting where you have just been insulted. You are much more likely to leap across the table and throttle your supervisor. <laughs> and you will be fired. Everybody else felt as you felt, thought what you thought, and summarily suppressed it. In their mind, they throttle the supervisor. <laughs> but it is not released to be expressed through the spinal cord into real behavior and action. And now you understand the difference. The mood is the same. The expression of the mood is not. There is no stopping to self-regulate the emotional state. So we now know that emotional impulsiveness and dysregulation are just as much a part of adult ADHD as our inattention, poor working memory, poor time management, and impulsive decision making. And now you know why. It is the inability of this anterior cingulate to govern that limbic system so that emotions, once provoked, get expressed without the top-down management that other people would be doing using the frontal lobe to reach in, take hold, and fine-tune the limbic system so that it is more appropriate for social goals. <clears throat> we know that these parts of the brain are two to three years delayed in their development. If you are here yesterday, you saw this diagram. This is Philip Shaw's fascinating study. This was a multi-site study done between Montreal and New, uh, excuse me, Washington, D.C. And we have nearly 225 ADHD and an equal number of controlled children being followed for 10 years and rescanned four times. And now what we can do in this study is to compute the degree of the structural lag. The darker the color, the greater the developmental delay. Now, this is brain size, not function, but it does prove the point that the principal delay created by ADHD is in that frontal lobe. And you can see that here from the top-down view of ADHD. These are your frontal structures and the side view. Now, interesting, there's a back part of the brain here between the occipital, parietal, and temporal lobe. This is an association area that is also delayed. That was not easily understood by these authors, but it will become evident once we get into the neuropsychology of ADHD as to why that might also be impaired. <clears throat> this is just a mathematical way of showing the same delay. And you can see that the blue line is the ADHD group, and you can see that they are lagging behind the rapid maturation seen in the general population. It's even more evident over here in the prefrontal lobe. This is the part of the brain that matures too early. People with ADHD have this part developing too quickly. This is the primary motor zone. This is where small, discrete behaviors are executed. Hence the restless, hyperactive, off-task, irrelevant motor movements often seen in the young child with ADHD. You've got a hypermature primary motor strip that is ungoverned by an immature frontal cortex, and that gives you your hyperactivity. But the hyperactivity will decline markedly with age, becoming internal in form, a subjective sense of restlessness, but not an outward hyperactivity. The adults that we have seen in our clinics and in our research projects do not climb on furniture. Spouses do not bring them in because they're sliding downstairs in suitcases. <laughs> We don't see them building ramps in the snow over roadways so that they can jump their sleds across the road. One of my patients tried to do that. Right? But the adult with ADHD commonly reports an inner restlessness, both of thought and activity, where they describe themselves as needing to be busy, to be engaged in multiple activities. The term multitasking has been used with, for this inappropriately. Multitasking refers to people who can successfully do multiple <laughs> things at a time. You may have multiple things going on, but they're not getting done. <laughs> there is also another popular phrase in some of the adult ADHD trade books. Adults with ADHD are good at hyper-focusing. This, too, is mythology. 
Hyper-focusing is actually perseveration. You are unable to interrupt what you're doing when you should have shifted to doing something else. It is like the child who continues to play the video game long after they should have been getting dressed for school and out to the bus. You want to call that hyper-focusing? That's fine, but that is a classic sign of a frontal lobe injury, and it is perseverative responding. You should have stopped what you're doing, and you didn't. There were other, more important goals to have been accomplished, and you ignored them. This is no gift. It is, in fact, a symptom of this disorder. Hyperfocusing goes with autism. Perseveration goes with ADHD. Now, we can subdivide these structures into three separate functional networks. The functions of these networks are something somewhat different. And it will help you to understand the nature of ADHD to take a quick look at these three different structures. I'm not the only person arguing this. You can see at the bottom of my slide there are three separate reviews of the neurology of ADHD that come to the same conclusion. There is that connection from the frontal lobe back into the basal ganglia that we talked about. This is the frontal striatal circuit. What does it do? Well, it is called in the vernacular the cool executive network, so-called because it engages in cold, rational reasoning. If we're going to use sort of a Cartesian split between emotion and thought, which doesn't really exist, but for the sake of argument, let's say that it does, that the ability to contemplate the what, what will I do? This is sort of the rational part. What needs to be done? What's going to happen? How should I do it? That is the function of this frontal straight loop. This is where your working memory is, and in working memory, we hold our plans and intentions and steps to accomplish those plans, as we've already talked about. So it's the cool, the what system. The second system is the one toward the bottom here. This is the connections from the frontal lobe straight back into the cerebellum. This is also a cool executive system, and this is the when network because this network determines when you will do what you had planned to do. The first network is the what, but what is of no value if you don't know when. There is a commercial on television in the United States that captures this distinction beautifully. People pulling up to a toll booth, then pulling up about 100 yards further and throwing the coins out onto the street. <laughs> you have executed the behavior perfectly. <laughs> You just didn't do it in the right sequence at the right time. The timing of your actions is just as important as the what you are going to do. There's also part of this, uh, this advertising campaign in which an individual is sitting at dinner with his girlfriend, and he's not saying anything, and he's not saying anything, and finally she just goes, well, she throws her napkin down and stands up, and after she leaves, he says, will you marry me? I'd say you got that one ill-timed as well. So timing is crucial, and that is what the frontocerebellar system is doing. It is determining when you will do what you had hoped to do. The third network is the one I just described, from the frontal cortex through the anterior cingulate into the limbic system. This is the emotion network and it is called the hot executive system for that reason, because this is where you moderate your emotions to be consistent with your goals, what you hope to accomplish. And as we've already said, we can expect people with ADHD to have major problems in that area. But what most people fail to appreciate about this is that the definition of an emotion is a motivational state. I can see I've put someone to sleep already. <laughs> An emotion is a motivational state, and it can be plotted on a three-dimensional axis. There is level of arousal. There is approach withdrawal, and there is reward punishment, which is the motivational aspect of emotion. And on that three-dimensional grid, all human emotion can be plotted. But the most important one I want to focus on right now is the motivational dimension. Because if emotions are motivations, and you can self-regulate your emotions using your frontal lobe, 
you can self-regulate your motivation. So that the frontolimbic circuit is the source of self-motivation. This is where you are able to motivate yourself in the absence of consequences. This is where you think about those goals, and in thinking about them, it actually motivates you. It actually creates a positive, motivational mood state. You want that goal, you want to attain it, and you will use that motivation to sustain action over time in the absence of consequences. Humans are the only species that can sustain behavior for more than seconds to a minute in the absence of a consequence. All other species are Skinnerian, stimulus response organisms, but not humans. Humans can build in a pause, and in that pause, they can aim their behavior further ahead in time, and they can reach into the limbic system and motivate that behavior. This is the source of drive, persistence, willpower, stick to the ability to chart a course and to dog it to death. As Walt Disney said, the secret of all success is this ability to take an idea and to sustain action toward it in spite of all irrelevant activity going on around you. You know it as persistence and determination. Most adults would refer to this as willpower. And it is what many adults with ADHD who we have interviewed have said that they lack. The ability to engage in a self-disciplined, persistent course toward their goals. They have goals. They have ideas. They have wishes. They have dreams. There are things they hope to accomplish in life, and most of them will never be attained. Not because the ideas were not good ones. Not because the what and the when were impaired but because they can't fuel the fuel tank. This is like a great cruise missile with a brilliant computer system and a map of the enemy's terrain, and the fuel tank is empty. The missile sits on the launching pad. Brilliant as its plans may be, it cannot get off the pad. You need self-motivation for all future-directed behavior. And so now we know where the self-motivation deficits are coming from. The corollary of this deficit is that people with ADHD will always be dependent on the immediate consequences that surround them for how long they can sustain an action, for how long they can persist. They will be externally dependent on the fuel for their behavior. Others are internally dependent. They generate their own motivational states. So now you know why it is so hard to sustain action toward a goal, because part of the deficit is motivational. ADHD is MDD, Motivation Deficit Disorder, in part. Do you see now how understanding the neuroanatomy of ADHD helps us to understand the nature of ADHD, the complexity of ADHD, the seriousness of ADHD, as I will show in my next presentation, and why ADHD is the most impairing outpatient disorder seen in psychiatric clinics. It is not impairing because of some distractibility or inattention. It is so impairing because it is a self-regulation disorder that affects the entire executive system. And this is nowhere more evident than in the adult as opposed to the child because it takes 30 years for these functions to fully mature. And when they finally reach maturity, all of these areas will be areas of symptoms for the adult. Three-year-olds are just hyperactive. Three-year-olds don't need working memory, a sense of time, self-motivation, organization, the when, the where, the what, the how, and the hot executive functions. The adult with ADHD will have five deficits, the young child but one.